First of all, welcome to Robotic Caregivers from Dreams to Reality. Uh, Zachary and I are very excited to be teaching this class. It's the second time we're doing it. Uh, last time, you know, it was really touch and go because we were making up as we went along. This time, I think we have a better sense of what we're trying to accomplish. At the same time, we're still going to be exploring things. It's only the second time, and we're, we'd really appreciate your uh, understanding and feedback. I have two jobs. Uh, I'm, I'm an associate professor with tenure here in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Georgia Tech. I've been here since 2006, but uh, in 2017, I founded a company uh, which is called Hello Robot Inc., and we just launched our first product in July of 2020. And so as part of that, you know, that company commercialized technology from my lab, and so it licensed IP that I'm one of the inventors of. And so I get royalties if they sell a product. Uh, in addition to that, you know, I own equity in Hello Robot because I'm one of the co-founders. So if its value increases, then you know, that would be a benefit to me. At the same time, you know, I've had w a lot of valuable experiences now as an entrepreneur and through this process. Prior to that, I'd always been an academic. So I've learned a lot about trying to get things into the real world, which was the main motivation for the company. Uh, and just what, is, what are the real world challenges for getting robots out there, entrepreneurship. And I plan to integrate that into my teaching. Uh, and later in the course, actually, we'll explicitly talk about entrepreneurship and I'll, I'll have a presentation and such. But uh, and then in addition to that, you know, that robot right there, that's actually the robot from my company. And, and so uh, it probably will make sense at some point. I'll, I'll demo it for you just so that you can get a sense of a real robot because I'm, I'm here at home in my basement. So it seems like might as well take advantage of it since we're doing this remote education. But, you know, because of that, I want you to know about that relationship I have with Hello Robot because it is a conflict of interest. It's managed by Georgia Tech, but I think it's important for you to, to be aware of it. I don't expect it to be a problem, but I think it's really important for you to be aware of it. A any questions about that? Does that make sense? Okay, great. So I will proceed then. I'm also, I've got multiple windows and I'm trying to get, I, I want to maintain good eye contact with you, but also I've got this thing with this big panel and then I've got this thing with the slides. So, you know, we're, just bear with me as I'm uh, rearranging things on my desktop and getting familiar with all this. Okay, so the dream, you know, what is this about? It's from dreams to reality. And, you know, the dream has been with people for a long time, and, and we'll touch on that a bit at the end of the lecture, which is that we have intelligent robots that can actually care for us, you know, that can help us overcome our individual limitations and help us, you know, in the broad sense, you know, the limitations, it could be we're sick or we're injured, we have a disability, or it could be, you know, it could be chronic, it could be short term, and wouldn't it be nice if we had robots that could help us, but more generally, you could imagine robots that just help us become the best person we can become. And so, you know, really flourish as, as human beings. And of course, all this uh, sounds great until then you also want uh, it to be affordable and to really work and for lots of people to be able to use it. And, you know, there are interesting things that have been demonstrated in laboratories, but very few things have actually made it out into the real world helping people. So, so this dream is a very long-term dream, and it's going to take a long time to get there. But the hope is that through this class, we can find ways to start moving towards that and hopefully makes things more of a reality. You know, it's a grand challenge. Uh, it, part of the reason it's a grand challenge is because it's multidisciplinary. Uh, I'm excited because a lot of the people in, in the course right now have a bio background, you know, biomedical engineering. But it really, it's, you know, it is... Any engineering you can think of probably has some relationship to this effort. Uh, in my mind, it reminds me a lot of aerospace engineering, which is, of course, a much more mature discipline. But and, and really, in the context of healthcare and caregiving robots, it's it goes beyond that to, I mean, for the best examples we have of caregivers are really people. You know, people are amazing caregivers. They're so versatile and they can help us in so many ways. And, and they understand uh, at a deep level just what it is to be human and then how to help people and support people. A really good caregiver, it's more than just the physical aspects of assistance. It's also this emotional understanding of the person whom that is being cared for. And so 
you know, it's, it really is this grand challenge. Um, and then, of course, if you're interested in also getting it into the real world, then there are these aspects of business which, which also come into play. So before we go any further, yet we're arranging this to be a problem-based learning class. And so a lot of the lectures and a lot of, or a lot of the class sessions are going to be devoted to you being in a team working on problems. And then the teams coalescing, coming back together and sharing what they've learned and, and hopefully keeping it very engaging. And so we're going to have breakout groups and such. You know, in that spirit, I want to take time now just for each of us to share our, a bit about ourselves so that we start to get to know one another. You're going to get to know your team really well. And you'll also, because we're a small class, you should have an opportunity to get to know the, the class as a whole too. Uh, to get that started, this is uh, a bit about, about me. Um, okay, so we, this is a mix of undergraduates and graduate students. It's about 50-50. So because of that, uh, typically the way I work things is when I'm uh, with graduate students, I'm Charlie. And when I'm with undergraduates, I'm Professor Kemp or Dr. Kemp. Given that we have undergraduates in the class, I, I would request that I just be Professor Kemp or Dr. Kemp for this class. I know that might be difficult for some graduate students who feel very comfortable with their faculty, but I think it would, it would help everybody uh, just to have that standard. And uh, I think I know what this links to. We'll see. Oh, yeah. Oops. This is a, this is a classic little cartoon that uh, you know, I, I think I has some truth to it. I don't know if you've ever looked at PhD comics. So we'll, we'll share all the materials later so you can see it in detail. Uh, I was trained as a computer scientist uh, in artificial intelligence and robotics at MIT. I was there as an undergraduate and then as a graduate student and then as a postdoc, uh, really for too long. And then I found a healthcare robotics lab in 2007. We've been multidisciplinary. We've had biomedical engineers, but we've also had computer scientists and electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, and they've all done very well. I feel really happy about the great people I've gotten to work with. I've primarily taught biomedical engineering courses. Uh, Biomechanics in particular, I've taught many, many terms of that. Uh, PBL as well, problem-based learning class. And I've, I've gotten a couple of awards for teaching, which hopefully will help me out here. Um, not the awards themselves, but hopefully they're a sign that I'll, I'll be able to, in this different context, give you a good educational experience. Um, biomedical, biomedical engineering faculty, but I also have adjunct appointments in interactive computing, electrical engineering. And as I noted before, I co-founded Startup. And if, if you want to learn more about me, you, know, you go to my website, and that has a lot of links and, and information. OK, next, other key player in this class, the, the co-instructor and co-developer of the class, Zachary Erickson. Ha! Ah. All right. Th thanks, Zachary. Appreciate it. And yeah, as, as Zachary mentioned, uh, I think he mentioned, I mean, he is the creator of Assistive Gym which is the software system that we're going to be using throughout this class. And we're really fortunate that we have the world expert on that system. Uh, people are using it in Stanford and Berkeley, uh, CMU, lots of universities are using it now. And it's perfect for this situation because it's this great physics-based simulation where physics, it simulates a human and simulates robots, uh, provides, uh, plugs in open AI, so it does reinforcement learning and uh, it's Python-based. So, I feel extremely fortunate that he's, uh, he's with us here. All right, so now I'd like to hear a little bit about each of you. Uh, they can be, yeah, I think for now brief, and then when we have our breakout sessions, you'll be able to share more about yourselves. But uh, love, to, love to learn. So uh, unmute yourselves one after another. Great. Uh, yeah, I have, by the way, I would just say, you know, I have a feeling that, or my expectation is that robots will take many forms uh, in terms of their physical instantiation and how they help people. And, you know, there, there won't just be one robot that does everything. So I, I think it's great that people are interested in prostheses and, and wearable robots as well. Great. Well, th thank you everyone for sharing. I really appreciate it. It's a great group of people and, uh, Look forward to getting to know you better throughout the term. So, yeah, you know, you're the future. Uh, you may or may not realize that. I think you probably do, uh, especially because this is it's really at the dawn of medical robotics and healthcare robots, caregiving robots. And so there's a lot to be done. There's surprisingly little out there. And there's not really that much even in the way of uh, education. 
So uh, I think that's something we want to do here is to try to help you make the, the future of caregiving robots a reality. And, you know, if you have ideas on how we can do that better, we, we want to hear it. And, uh, yeah, I, I truly believe, you know, 10 years from now, uh, just based on the way the, the various relevant technologies are developing, that, that we are going to finally see robots out there doing all sorts of things that uh, right now only humans would be doing and to enhance our lives and help enhance our health. So, uh, as I mentioned, we want your help. Uh, it's just the second time we're teaching it. It's new. It's a new type of class for Georgia Tech, arguably new for the world. I don't know of another class quite like this. Uh, and we want to try to make it something special that, that really matters. So uh, when we are in class, uh, oh, I forgot my, you can just imagine a little mobile phone there. You know, definitely want your full attention and to take advantage of it. I think this is especially true with uh, remote class like this. There's just, it's, and I've, I'm guilty of this, right? I go to some meeting and, you know, you get out of it what you put into it. If I go to a meeting and I turn off my video and I mute myself, it's not long before I've been, you know, drawn away by something on my phone or something in my email and I'm just not there. And so while we're here, what Zachary and I would ask is that, you, you know, you really take advantage of it. We see you, you engage with us. And we're going to try to have these, it's a small enough class. We're going to have these breakout groups that I, I think it can be a really uh, worthwhile and meaningful and interactive kind of experience. I, I taught PBL uh, 2250, which is an undergraduate course, problem-based learning undergraduate course in BME last term. We used Teams. We had these small breakout groups. And I, I was actually very surprised at how well it worked. In some ways, I liked it better than the in-person. I felt like it was more effective. So we're going to try to take advantage of those same same sorts of approaches. Uh, same kind of thing when I've gone to conferences or workshops, when it's actually been effective is when it's been a small group and everyone's been sharing their video and talking and engaging with one another. So, so that's what we're going to strive for. Please take advantage of it. Do your best. And we will be fully committed to you. Uh, grades, this is something which, you know, maybe graduate students are less uh, worried about, but I know it's important to undergraduates at least. Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit about that. You know, my philosophy is I want everyone to make an A. That's, there is no reason that everyone in this class can't make an A. That's my preference. That in some ways, that's my, almost my default would be, you know, you start with it. I, I would say you start with an A and then, you know, it's yours to lose. Uh, you do have to earn it. You know, there are requirements. We are going to be expecting a lot of you. Uh, but I also, especially, you know, given how, how capable all of you are in your backgrounds, I just, I, let, let's make that happen. Let's have that as a joint goal. All of you earn A's. Uh, in terms of how that grade's going to be computed, it's just divided up evenly between class participation, literature presentations, midterm project fought, final project and we'll you'll learn more about what those will involve as time goes on uh, and as Zachary and I learn more about what those involve uh, class participation is pretty clear midterm project and final project are pretty clear we, we have a good sense for what the midterm project will be final project will be a little bit of new territory for us uh, literature presentations is something that will be we didn't do last time we taught this so so we're going to have to work through it and see how it works out uh, yeah, this is, if you go to the registrar at Georgia Tech, this is its guidance it provides in terms of what the grades mean. And so I, I like to have, I don't do a curve. I don't want a curve. Uh, it's, of course, less meaningful even in this kind of small setting. But in general, I like to have just something where uh, ideally we're updating any types of grades that you're getting. We're updating it on Canvas and you're able to easily compute what does that mean in terms of a letter grade. We want you to always know how you're doing. Because I, I know for me personally, I found it really frustrating when there'd be some weird curve and I'd have these, you know, it's like 40 on a test, but that's an A. And, and then, you know, I didn't know where I was in a class. So, you know, if you ever feel like we're not being adequately transparent about where you are in terms of a letter grade, you know, just, just let us know and we'll, we'll try to rectify the situation. Uh, you know, the first assignment, which I don't know if this is going to be a graded assignment, but it's certainly important for the class as a whole, which is just to make sure you know Python. Uh, I think most of you have some experience with Python. 
uh, it's worth doing some review. It, Python is worth learning and being good at it. It is, it's just grown and grown in terms of its prominence. You know, by some measures, it's, it's one of the, if not the most popular and influential computer languages right now in the world. So you, it would not be, it will not be time wasted. It will go far beyond this class. In the class, you're also going to have lots of opportunities to use it. Uh, these are just some links. Uh, actually, I haven't updated these from last year, so I can't completely confirm that they're the best places to go. But there are some examples of places you can go to online practice Python if, if you need a refresher. Or if you're, um, yeah, well, let's just say refresher. Zachary also has done a great job. He set up uh, this Google, is it Collab or Collab? Do you know? Anyone know? Okay, let's just say it's Collab. So Zachary set this up, super cool. You can go here and he's provided some exercises that you can try in your browser. And uh, a lot of, I think a lot of the things that you'll be doing with this physics simulation environment as part of your projects and as part of the class will be, will also involve browser-based use of Python. So it's, uh, and probably Google Collab. So uh, I encourage you to go through this. Okay, so it's a question about your first project. So this is gonna give you a sense for your first project. So the midterm project, the main goal is to beat a baseline controller in assistive gym. So assistive gym, what it does is it models various assistive tasks. It has a model of a human, it has various commercially available robots, and it also comes with these baseline controllers that have been trained using reinforcement learning that enable the robots to help people at, on these various caregiving tasks. So the goal is, and this can, it's, a, it's actually, you can interpret this very broadly, and we'll spend more time talking about the project later, is you know, to see, can you do, find a way to make these simulated robots help the simulated person more effectively in one of these tasks. Uh, so, and usually how this works, and, and we'll structure it in this way, your group will pick an assistive task, such as feeding assistance, then you're going to have this trained robot controller that can already assist with a task at some level. You're going to explore that default controller and find out what are its limitations, weaknesses, failures, you know, how, I, I guarantee you that none of these baseline controllers is perfect, and some of them are actually quite deficient, and, and you'll get to explore that and find out why and how. Uh, and then, like I said, design and implement a method for the robots to actually do better than that, that baseline controller. That's, that's the goal. The, the key dates, which are good for you to start focusing on now and get in your calendar, the, the project status presentation is going to be February 2nd in class, with you, and that will be your team. Uh, these are all, by the way, the two teams, you know, it will be, each of those teams will be doing a midterm project. So there will be two midterm project status presentations. There will be two midterm project uh, presentations. On Wait, now we've got two days all allotted, but I, we, I imagine it will just be one, one lecture that, because there are just two teams. Uh, if, if we do that, do you think it will be the first date or the, se the second, Zachary? Any guess? I plan for the first date. You plan on the first date, there's a chance it would be the second, but that would just give you more time. Okay, cl class structure. I don't actually know if half and half is actually half of something and half of something else. And that's kind of like this class. <laughs> it's it's going to be approximately half lectures and invited talks and half where you're with your teams working on on things and trying to solve problems uh, so for the rest of today we're going to talk show a little bit about you know it's from dreams to reality we're going to go through some uh examples from science fiction that you know impressed me and have impressed zachary and maybe get you thinking uh, maybe they'll remind you of some things and then after that, we're going to have the two teams break out and go through these icebreaker questions that are relevant to the class. Uh, if you go to Wikipedia, this is the picture they have for icebreakers. We're not doing that. I think she has to find a cup. Uh, 
and we couldn't really, well, that'd be interesting to try to do remotely, but no, it's going to be much more focused on the class. So examples from science fiction. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Isaac Asimov, but yeah, he's uh, quite famous as a science fiction author from the golden age of science fiction and was one of the first science fiction authors to really have this fleshed out concept of what robots might be. Uh, something I think is especially interesting is that you know, he was thinking about some of his first stories with robots are it's a robot, a robot that takes care of children, you know, which it's uh, there are companies now trying to do that, at least on the social side. But of course, this was this fully you know, this robot that could play with kids in all sorts of dramatic ways. And uh, I, I think it's quite, quite inspiring. Uh, you go later, I, you know, Empire Strikes Back had something I thought was quite fascinating in terms of it's a, really one of the first on-screen representations of sort of surgical robots and, and have uh, you know, different types of robots helping someone in various ways. Uh, Moon, as a, which you may or may not be aware of, something I liked about this robot that performed health care services is uh, it's fascinating to me because one aspect of healthcare care is, in fact, the social side of it. That My lab focuses more on the physical side. But I, I found it remarkable that with this simple rendition of a face, it's just these really almost like little simple emoji, it, it actually had this compelling personality and did quite a good job of uh, interacting with the person and conveying this, this social presence. Uh, Robot and Frank, which you may or may not be familiar with, is uh, I recommend it. I'm not going to give away, I don't want to do any spoilers, but the, the, within the robotics community, people have often justified their research with the notion that eventually robots will be able to uh, provide assistance to older adults because uh, in a number of countries you have these aging demographics and shortages of healthcare workers. And this was sort of this fleshed out realization of what that might be like with a humanoid-like robot. And there are, uh, like Honda was one of the first companies to really create uh, something that looked actually quite similar to the robot there. Um, you know, the reality is there are a lot of challenges about that kind of approach and you know, taking a humanoid form uh, has some disadvantages in, in terms of cost and complexity. But uh, this, this particular movie brings up some of the, uh, realizes some of the challenges you might have if you have a caregiving robot that has a particular agenda and ways in which it should help the older adult. And the older adult wants to maybe creatively use that robot. And well, should the, who should be in charge and how should that work? You know, uh, it's, I think it's quite interesting. I'm going to let Zachary talk about this one because he, he added this to, to the list. Uh, Interstellar, go for it. <laughs> yes, and, and illustrates uh, one of the, I mean, it's a real concern that's brought up many times. I, I even see it in uh, grant reviews and such, like from the NIH, is that uh, in WALL-E, the, the humans have become overly dependent on the robots and are not engaging in healthy behaviors. And, and that sort of dependence, uh, even for s relatively simple robots that might provide some physical assistance, there's a real concern, well, what if people, it results in people moving less? And we know in being less physically active, which would be detrimental to their health. Uh, yeah, another thing I like about Interstellar personally is that there is, throughout science fiction and kind of dreams of robotics, there's a great tendency for the robots to be imagined as pretty much being human-like. They're in some way humanoid, you know, they, they are anthropomorphic. And yet, you know, as, as we mature, I, it's sort of like the aerospace industry. When, when people were first thinking about planes, there was a tendency to think of them in terms of birds. Or if you look at cars, and, and when cars first started appearing, they looked very much like horse-drawn carriages. And so, you know, there's this tendency for engineers as well as uh, create creative people to initially be thinking in terms of what they're most familiar with. But over time, you know, as, as engineers and society explore technologies, they usually come up with divergent forms that, that really better, can better meet the needs and be better matched to what the goals are. Uh, la last one, which I think is really worth noting, is Big Hero 6. I mean, it was... The whole movie is around this protagonist that is a healthcare robot. Uh, it's also interesting because Disney has 
supported a lot of robotics research. Uh, and Disney, in fact, was you know, a pioneer in robotics. Their animatronic systems that were, were used long ago in the previous century you know, really quite remarkable what they're able to achieve, like Pirates of, of uh, Penzance, is that it? And uh, the Small World, and you know, just all these animatronics that where they would have actually, I think it was tape on, on tape, analog tape, it would have the mo movements for them as well as the sounds. And, and I think they even use like teleoperated systems in order to record these human, like realistic humanoid motions. Um, so Disney has a long history in this space. And for this movie, they, they actually drew on experts in soft robotics at CMU to inform the story and or at least the design of the robot in Baymax. I think Chris Atkinson in particular, who's a, a very well-known roboticist and who's a professor at CMU. So that that is, oh, and actually I'll say one more thing about that. It it still has a humanoid form, but one way in which it it diverges from common robotics approaches is that it's it's inflatable and it's very soft and soft robotics this this movie was quite i'd say the timing of it is interesting because it became this thing right when i'd say soft robotics started taking off within the academic community there had been lots of work that you could call soft robotics in the academic community but it's around the same time this movie came out that that it became came, you know, a journal formed, and you just see so much activity in that area. So now what we're going to do is everyone, you're going to break up into your teams. We're, we're trying to make as much of the materials for this course open as possible, where we'll just have them available to anyone on the web. Uh, we'll also, of course, be working very hard to make sure that none of the inf your private information leaks out. You know, these should all be anonymized, except for information about Zachary and me. If you go to this folder here, uh, you'll find the open materials that we have so far. Uh, I'll, I'll sh we'll share all this. I'll share the link. Uh, I can share it in Teams shortly. Uh, you should spend time with the syllabus. It's, it has a lot of the information that we talked about. You should also, um, you know, you can look at the lecture and review anything that's there, find links that you want. And then finally, what's especially relevant right now is that your team should open up the icebreakers, and I will at least send a, a link to this. Go through these instructions. Zachary and I will each be with one of the teams. And the, for the rest of the class, the goal is for you to go through this exercise and, and get to know one another.